Hello, and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to introduce to you now. Brian Pataffi is a physical therapist and athletic trainer in the sport of hockey. He is currently with the Chilliwack Chiefs, which will be Brian's 43rd year in the game of hockey, which he recently announced would be his last. While he has traveled the world with the sport, he spent a majority of his career with the Calgary Flames organization, including a stay here in Salt Lake City with my late beloved Golden Eagles. In 2009, Brian released his first book called Ice It Down, a look at pro hockey through a trainer's eyes, and is currently working on his second book, No Days Off, the story of a hockey purgatory. Brian is also a keynote speaker, host of the podcast Live with Taff, and a stand-up comedian. Brian's message focuses on positivity and how humor can enhance the workplace environment. Taff, it's an absolute honor to welcome you to Balanced Body Radio. Hey, you know what? It's fun to be here. And hey, what took you so long? <laughs> I mean, you had Theo on, uh, I don't know, three or four months ago. I figured I was going to just come in and clean that mess up for you. <laughs> Seriously, what a bum that guy is. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, yeah, a rich one. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I'm going to tell him the same thing that I am going to tell you, which is this morning I drove my car 20 minutes to one of six ice rinks in the valley. I grabbed all my gear, I walked past the garbage can that still has the Olympic branding from the 2002 Winter Olympics, and I stepped out onto the Art Tees ice rink <laughs> that, that still has a Golden Eagle on the ice, and I got to play around and practice with the sun rising behind the Wasatch Mountains. And I gotta tell you, man, I don't think any of that happens without what you guys did with the Golden Eagle. So I just have to say thank you. I'm just so full of gratitude for introducing us here in this valley to that sport and that type of environment it was just so amazing. I still remember my first Eagles games to this day. So dude, thanks. <laughs> Well, you know what? Um, I would love to take the credit for it, but you mentioned the man that uh, that's really, you know, responsible for all of that, and that was the late, uh, late great Artis. I mean, uh, we came in with Calgary. We came in uh, after the, uh, you know, the platform was there, and we just just built on it. We changed the colors, and, and we built on it. We won a championship our first year in there. We were competitive every year, and um, – you talk about all these ice rinks in the Valley. I remember when, when I came in, um, if we couldn't practice in the Salt Palace on Mondays, then we were out and bountiful. And if we couldn't practice in the Salt Palace on Wednesdays, then we were out in Cottonwood. And those were the only <laughs> other two choices in the Valley. We would dress at the Salt Palace and we would take two 15 passenger vans over to uh, our practice site. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. I bless my mom's heart. I still remember her, you know, car dressing me, <laughs> driving me, you know, 40 minutes up the road to Bountiful on Sunday morning at like 5 a.m. so I could practice as a little kiddo. And I can, I can still remember that place, like really low ceiling, really kind of dank environment. Like I know they fixed it up since then, but they weren't the best places to go practice. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, you know what? It was like it was like a warehouse with a sheet of ice in it. That's pretty much it, you know. And um, we would, like I say, we what I liked about it is um, because of the Sundays. You know, the Jazz wouldn't play Sundays, and we wouldn't play Sundays. Um, a big night uh, for NBA basketball was Monday nights. So with the Jazz floor being down in the South Palace of the Delta Center, we would be on the ice at Bountiful at eight in the morning. We'd be done by 9.15. The guys would be out of the rink by noon. And I would go out and watch the visiting NBA team do their shoot around at 12.15 and have my lunch. So it was a real neat situation to be in. I'm working hockey at 8 in the morning, watching NBA shoot around at noon. That is so cool. Man, so my dad does sports around here. Um, he's a sports anchor for Channel 4, and he has been for, geez, like 35 years. And so I was exposed to both um, hockey and basketball, um, you know, obviously with the Utah Jazz, like beloved team as well around here. Um, and I, I got the opportunity as a, as a kiddo, I don't know, I was like maybe eight or nine, and I got the opportunity to be a ball boy for the Utah Jazz. So you're sitting courtside, literally underneath the basket, like amazing, such a cool thing to be able to do. And I remember asking my dad, like, well, this is kind of dumb. Why don't they have this for hockey? I want to do this for hockey. <laughs> well, you know, you talk about being a ball boy for the Jazz. I think one of my biggest thrills was when Don Sparks was the trainer there, and I had hurt my ankle. So Don was doing the rehab on my ankle, and um, he had gone to Coach uh, Jerry Sloan, and he said, listen, he goes, uh, this guy knows nothing about the game. 
he goes, can he sit on the bench with us one night? And, uh, and I sat second row and Jerry and Frank Layden came to me and they said, we hear you're a bit of a magpie that likes to talk a lot. You sit on that bench. You don't say a word. And, um, uh, you know, and, and I enjoyed it. I remember Terry Clark was the assistant, uh, trainer and Sparky was the head guy and, and I got to sit on the bench and, and, and the LA Lakers were in for that game. And, and that's when magic was playing and everything else. Wow. And what a thrill for a kid from Canada, you know, um, my first real foray into the U S and, uh, and sitting on an NBA bench, uh, during a, a, a game with the Lakers, the jazz and the Lakers. Wow. It sounds like you appreciated that a lot more than I did. That's amazing. What were some of your other favorite memories of Salt Lake? Well, you know, I got to say that uh, just the the people there were just amazing. You know, I um, I don't know if you got a chance to read my first book, but uh, again, I, I talk about a kid from, from uh, you know, Ottawa, Canada, who I thought was worldly. I thought I was a real worldly guy. And so when uh, when Cliff Fletcher announced that the, they were moving the team to um, Salt Lake City, you know, I did some reading on it. I called a friend of mine, Guy Holm, or, uh, who was the uh, equipment manager with the Portland Pirates at the time, or the Maine Mariners, I'm sorry, in Portland. And uh, he was from Salt Lake, and he was giving me some insight on it. So I was reading about the Mormon faith, and um, but I didn't read deep enough. And when I first got out there, Artis's daughter, Diane, was my realtor. And she took me, um, we had found a house I wanted, and she had taken me to the uh, seller's re- realtor. And while I was sitting there, I said, I, I came right out and I said, you know, I've been here three days and I haven't seen a Mormon since I've been here. <laughs> and the realtor looked at me and goes, I beg your pardon. I says, well, I haven't seen a Mormon since I've been here. And she goes, well, what do you mean by that? And she was like taken aback a bit. I said, I have not seen one horse or one buggy since I've been here. And <laughs> Diane explained to me, no, Brian, that's either Mennonite or Amish. Mormons don't ride in horse and buggy. And I was totally embarrassed. I said, Diane, sign the deal. Let's get out of here. Like I, I just, I was just so embarrassed. But you know what? The neat thing was over the six years, I, I got to learn about the faith, got to, you know, all my neighbors were were really cool with me and 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 they they were patient with me and and uh and um they were just great people. And you know, and I had a couple of setbacks, um, both health wise and physically, and they're right over there at the door with meals and helping out, cutting the grass and everything else. It, it, it was just the people are just absolutely amazing in in not only Salt Lake City but all of Utah. Mm, yeah, we're really fortunate. We do have a lot of wonderful neighbors and people around here. We we're just enamored by this place. the The housing market today is probably a little bit different than it was back then. I've I've heard you talk about this before. How much did you pay for that first house? Fifty three thousand dollars with an in ground pool. <laughs> yeah, it's like I had that in my couch cushions. Wow. I mean, you, you don't hear about that. Like I I live in in um, in uh, British Columbia. You can't get a shack for less than a million bucks. Oh, in, yeah. in British Columbia, you know, and, and it's just, you know, 53,000. And then six years later, I sold it for 111. Wow. You know, that's yeah. Crazy. So it, yeah, it turned around real, it was turning around then because they were going after the Olympic bid then. And there were a lot of people from Southern California that were migrating to Utah. They were, they were getting away from the gang problem. A lot of people, and they were coming into Utah and they were used to paying that kind of price, you know, like, like, like big, real, you know, LA, you can't get into LA for less than a million right now and, and things like that. So, so it did, it really spiked the market and, and homeowners there right now, I mean, they're, you know, they're obviously sitting on a gold mine, which is great. If, if somebody like myself, if I were to come back, I would go through sticker shock, you know, looking at what I would have to pay compared to what I paid back in the eighties. Uh, Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, I mean, you'd have you'd have shock just seeing how full the valley is. I mean, we live on the west side of the valley. For the listener that doesn't understand, like this is farmland. This was never ever going to be developed, and it, sure enough, like every corner of this valley is being <laughs> developed in some way. It's pretty nuts. So, um, I'd like to talk about you and your career. Like, can you tell us a little bit of what what your job duty was as a hockey um, a trainer? Well, yeah. So, so what it was, you know, as an athletic trainer and physical therapist, most of uh, most of my job stemmed around injury management. 
But when I got into Calgary's organization, one of the things Cliff Fletcher had, had said to me, he said, you know, every little duty that you can add, he goes, you give yourself more value. And if you were to move on to another organization, not only are you an athletic trainer, not only are you a physical therapist, but what else can you do? So I took upon the logistics when I was in the American Hockey League working for Montreal's uh, farm team. I handled all our flights, charters, commercial, all our ground transportation, took care of our meal money, hotels, everything. I did all of that as the athletic trainer. And um, John, the, the late, great John Brophy, uh, who was our coach in Halifax, loved having me do that because he knew that if we checked into a hotel at three o'clock in the morning and there was an issue, that I was the guy who had dealt with the sales department of the hotel and I was right there. So I took that upon myself and, and, and carried it on. When I got the job with, with Calgary, that was part of the reason they hired me because they were putting a brand new franchise in Moncton, New Brunswick, and they were brought me in and, and they didn't have to bring in a hockey ops guy that was just going to handle logistics. I did that. And uh, as well as being the athletic trainer. Interesting. You you said you you handled um, injury management. I'm curious to know how did that evolve over time? Did did the injuries in the game change as the game has evolved? The injuries themselves didn't change. How we treated them changed. And uh, one of the things I'll I'll, I'll talk about is uh, uh, you know I graduated 1978. Between 1978 and about 1995, myself and every other athletic trainer in professional hockey did a disservice to our athletes because we were treating uh, head trauma as, you know, like, okay, we'll give him a shift off or give him the rest of the period off. Or, you know, uh, we weren't, you know, we didn't know the science of it. And so, you know, it was guys like Eric Lindros and things like that that came in and all of a sudden neuropsychs got involved, you know, and I, I pretty much had to go back to school to learn concussion management. And, I, you know, when I think back to some of the things that happened and some of the players and, you know, Stewie Grimson would go out and get into this battle and he'd come back to the bench and he'd, he'd look like he had been dropped from, you know, the top of the Salt Lake Marriott. And, and um, so, you know, we'd put an ice bag on his neck and say, OK, Stewie, take a shift off. You know, you don't do that anymore. And um, so, you know, it, it, the injuries themselves haven't changed. The science on how we treat them has changed. And, um, you know, for a guy like myself that's in my 60s, um, I had the choice back in 95 when all this was happening to either walk away from the game or to start continuing education and learn about concussion management and, and so on and so forth. One of the things I did when I was working in the Ontario Hockey League is um, I did a survey uh, for Impact, which is uh, – which is the uh, program used in the NHL, the American Hockey League, the East Coast League, and all of the Canadian Hockey League. It's a concussion management program. Well, I did a survey for them, uh, you know, based on concussions. And um, the OHL is a is a type of league, because it's a student-athlete league, where we would play Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday afternoon. We would do that probably three times in a month. You know, we'd play three in two and a half days. Well, going through this, uh, all the data I had from all 20 teams in the league, uh, 64% of our um, concussions happened in that third game in the two and a half days wow. because fatigue, travel, uh, you know, lack of sleep, diet, the whole thing. Uh, and, and so then we went, myself and Dr. Michael Zarnata, who's uh, uh, one of the big wigs with impact. We went before the board of governors and we stressed this to them. And um, so one of the things they, they needed to look at is either condensing the schedule and not playing the three and two and a half or taking that Sunday game and playing it Tuesday night. Well, now you're talking to bean counters when you're talking to owners and boards and board of governors, you're talking to people that look at, okay, if I play a Sunday game, I might have 3,200 people at that game. But if I move that to Tuesday night, I might only have 2,200 people. And so there was a lot of pushback and, and so on and so forth. And um, again, you know, uh, we, we, we're seeing it with the, with the gymnast right now and, and with what's going on with people, we need to take our athletes and treat them like thoroughbreds because that's what they are. They need to be fed right. 
They need to be rested when they need to rest. And they need to be let out of the barn and run when they need to run. But, but um, you know, and, and, and again, this is all this is all new and this is what's coming in. And, and uh, I'm, I'm kind of proud of myself because, like I said, in 95, one of the big things that happened in 97 is I got married. So I knew that, you know what, um, I had to, you know, protect myself and my job and what I did. So I had to jump back in this and, and I jumped back in both feet right into the fire. Wow. That's crazy. So we had a listener question. Um, a hockey buddy of mine actually asked, even just in the last like five to 10 years, what, what kind of skills and qualities are, are people looking at in a hockey player now that maybe they weren't looking at before? Like, how has that changed? How has the training changed? It really seems like these guys were doing a lot of big, heavy, you know, weightlifting, and now it's almost more like speed work or mobility is more favored. Can you, can you comment on that? Yeah. And right now it's, it's, you, you get away from the lifting. It's all core. It's all core strength. If you have strength in your core, you're protecting your quads, you're protecting your hamstrings. And, um, and that's where you need your, your, your strength. Um, we don't, uh, we don't go into the weight room and lift pianos anymore. The other thing is, um, it, the game is so competitive. When I got into the game, 1978, Utica, New York, guys came to training camp. We, we, we skated twice a day, and they use that two weeks twice a day to get into shape. You can't do that anymore. You've got to come to camp in shape. You know, there, there is a, a real tiny gap between making $6 million a year and making $60,000 a year in the American Hockey League. If you're a $6 million player, you don't want that $60,000 guy taking your job. So you come to camp and you come to camp ready. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. Dave Scatcher kind of told us a little bit about that and how that's evolved over time as well. Um, and, and, you know, he realized that he wasn't maybe the most talented person on the ice, but he learned from a very young age that he would have to outwork everybody to get anywhere in hockey. And, and he was able to do that. Um, it's super interesting. I, I want to ask you too, you've spent some time in Europe. How is the game different in Europe than it is here? Uh, well, first of all, Europe is, is just, if every guy in my position could experience Europe, I would advise them to go over and, and experience it. Number one, the culture is just, just unbelievable. It's a funny story before I went over, and I'll get back to that, but I think the big difference over there is the fans, okay? This is not a hockey game. It's an event, okay? They're in the parking lot at 2 o'clock in the afternoon for a 7.30 game, and they're out there, and they're, they're, they're doing the European version of uh, tailgating, and then when they're in the building, there's one section we call the fan section and it's in one end of the arena and every arena in Germany is like that. There's no seats. They stand up and they stand up for the whole game and they sing and they've got a drummer and they've got, Oh, it's, it's, it's <laughs> unbelievable. So I got out of the game in two fifteen, um, 2015, uh, not, I wasn't planning on getting out of the game. I thought I had another job. Things didn't work out. Came back to North Carolina with my family, and and uh, I went into into I don't say a little funk. I went into a big funk. I, you know, I had some mental health issues. Like like my wife told me, she said, you know what, you're like somebody that got let out of prison after 35 years. She goes, you um you 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 can't handle the outside. You got to go back in. You got to you know. So and I said, well, I don't want to move the kids again, the family again, because they moved all the time with me. And she says. Well, why don't you just take a job? We'll come and visit on weekends and so on and so forth. So, okay, the coming on weekends didn't work because I took a job in Germany with our, our old captain from Salt Lake and uh, who was a record holder there for a lot of things, Rich Turnamath. Rich had called me up and he had said, hey, you got any gas left in your tank? I said, oh, yeah. And so he brought me over to Germany. And um, my wife kind of laughed at me when I was packing to go because she says, you're not going to last two weeks over there because I was in my sixties. You know, she said, you won't last two weeks. And, and I've got this big goalie bag and I'm throwing everything but the kitchen sink in it. And I got my two suitcases and, you know, she's driving me to the airport in Raleigh and I'm going to fly Raleigh to Toronto, Toronto to Frankfurt. And, uh, fortunately my son was a techie and he showed me how to work, um, excuse me, WhatsApp on the telephone so I could make these video calls back home. <laughs> well, I got over to Germany and I forgot to call. Um, I just like fell in love with the place. Uh, just, just 
the culture, like I said, the old buildings. I lived in an apartment. You wouldn't know it on the inside. But the, the building I was in was over 400 years old. I mean, it was wow. older than the United States of America, you know, um, you know, with, with three foot thick walls, but on the inside, all renovated and, you know, just looked like any other modern apartment building. And, uh, you know, so it was a, it was a great experience. My family came over at Christmas. They came over for a month and, and we spent uh, New Year's in Paris and, and, you know, we just did all the things and, and uh, you know, that, that tourists do uh, for that month. And and for the time I was over there with Rich and Paul Gardner, it was uh, just just amazing. And I was going to go back. I was set to go back the following year. But Rich had been let go and Paul had been let go. And, and I had gotten a, an offer uh, in the first division. And, and um, just uh, the way I, I saw things shake out at the end, I said, you know, I don't want to get over here and, and, and get stuck, you know, like, like, um, because some things, you know, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, ownership over there looks at things a little bit differently and, uh, and, uh, they have no problem. You know, Paul Gardner, our head coach got fired two games into the playoffs. Rich Turnham as our GM who had been with that organization for years had got fired three days before Christmas. Wow. Well, you know what? Yeah, that's, that's inhumane. You know, that, that, I'm sorry. Um, so I just said, okay, I'm not going back to Frankfurt. There was an opportunity to go to Ingolstadt. And, um, but before everything shook out in Frankfurt, when they found out I wasn't going to come back, they canceled my plane ticket home. Wow. So I, yeah, yeah. So, but, but that's, you know, that's, you know, we just got in with a bad owner. So, you know, um, I, I remember um, because over there, when you go over there as a North American, you're advised to buy lawyer's insurance. I never heard of such a thing, but I paid $15 a month and I had this lawyer on retainer. And then when he had to go and represent me and get what I was owed because I didn't get my last month's salary and I didn't, and they didn't pay my flight home and everything else. He got it all back. It took, it took about eight months. He got it all back, but he calls me up and he says, well, do you have money to get home? And I said, yeah, I, I got money to get home. I, I said, I made good money over here. And I, you know, I didn't spend every penny of it, so I got money to get home. But I said I'm a little, you know, a little peed off because it shouldn't be my responsibility. And uh, I said, so if I'm paying my own way, I'm flying home first class, and you can get that back for me too. And and he did. Wow, that's great. That's great. I understand there was a little bit of a language barrier. There was no chance we were going to talk about Europe without talking about the stick order you tried to make. Oh goodness, yeah, yeah. Well, that that. Uh, yeah, that that was, and again, that that's um, um, just like like you say, the language. See over there, um, you know, teams sign deals. They sign individual deals, like like the e, the East Coast League or the ECHL, whatever they're called. They sign a league wide deal with CCM or with Warrior or whoever they're with. Over there, each team signs their own license deal. So we were signed with CCM. We had a guy named Christian Kornberger, and Christian lived in Austria. And um, Christian's English was about as good as my German. So it was non-existent. And uh, uh, I remember he told me, he goes, Brian, he goes, you order sticks in lots of three, six, nine, or 12. He goes, you can't order two. You can order 24. You can order 18. You know, and he's explaining I said, well, that's good because in, in North America, you have to order them in lots of 12 and so on and so forth. So, so anyway, the first order of sticks was already placed by the, uh, by the uh, general manager. I wasn't even the equipment manager in, in uh, Frankfurt, but that's another story. Uh, the equipment manager we had there didn't know how to sharpen skates, and he wasn't allowed to order equipment because he didn't know how to work POs and everything. He was more or less there to do the laundry. So, uh -huh. so I found out when I got over there, I was going to be sharpening skates as well as ordering the sticks, but they had their first month sticks. And so I go into the room and I do an inventory and I said, okay, you know, this is what I need for this guy. This is what I need for this guy. And so I call up Christian and I said, Christian, I want to place an order. He says, okay. I said, do you have a roster in front of you? I do. I said, okay. I said, Brett Yeager. He goes, Brett Yeager. I said, nine he goes okay he i said mike card he goes mike card i said nine 
you know, and then I went through the whole, I was getting everybody nine sticks and said three guys. I was getting 12 for them because they were hard on them. The two break roids brothers that were out of uh, Saskatchewan, they'd go through two sticks a game. So, you know, I, I got 12 for them and, and uh, 12 for a guy named Pavel Dronia because he was just such a good guy. And I, I just, and, 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 and I like Pavel so much that I wanted to make sure that we never (laughs) shorted him on sticks. So anyway, uh, um, so at the end of me giving my order, he goes, so you need 36 units. I go, what? He goes, you need 36 units. I said, no. I said, I just gave you the order. He goes, yeah. You tell me, Jaeger, nine. Card, nine. This guy, nine. You know, and I go, yeah, nine. He goes, which means no. And I said, <laughs> no, it means nine sticks. Nine, six, seven, eight, nine. He goes, must do over. I said, okay. He goes, Brett Jaeger. I said, 12. <laughs> Mike Card, 12. I never ordered nine sticks again. <laughs> it's so good. I love that story. <laughs> Way to learn your lesson. Yeah. <laughs> That's tremendous. <laughs> oh, look, we had a guy, Tim Schula, and Tim Schula, uh, you know, good German kid. And, and uh, he encouraged me to take German. He said, I want you to take German. You're living in my country. I want you to live in my country. I want you to learn the language. And we had an opportunity and I did take, take German, but, um, you know, I wasn't even one lesson in and I said, uh, I'm out in the parking lot. And I said, Tim, I'm going to walk over to Reve and get a coffee. And, uh, I said, um, but I, I, I need, I need, uh, cream. I said, I don't take sugar, just cream. And he goes, he goes, you say Ions, which is one Ions cafe. And he goes with Zimf, Zimf. And I said, Zemp? And he goes, yeah. And I said, okay. So I walk over to Reve. And unbeknown to me, he's outside the store watching. And I walk in. And you don't help yourself in Germany. They they have a barista that works with you and everything. So I said, I said, Eins Café, uh, Zwei, which, which is two, Zemp. And the lady looks at me and goes, Zwei, Zemp? I said, yeah, Zwei, Zemp. Well, Zemp is mustard. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and he set me up. So this lady pours me a coffee and puts two shots of mustard in it and stands there to watch me drink it, right? So I take one sip, walk out the door. There's Shula outside the door. And I said, Timmy, he goes, that's why you must take German. <laughs> so, so yeah, there was a, there was a lot of breaking in. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> I absolutely love that. I knew you would be full of so many great stories and a lot of humor. I know you do some stand-up too. Um, I'm really curious, how how has humor played such a role in your life? Why is that so important for you? Well, okay, I um, I grew up with a speech impediment. My dad was in the Air Force, and uh, I have a lisp. I don't know if you can hear it. Uh, my kids certainly do, because they make fun of me with it all the time. But but I have a lisp. And when, uh, uh, when I was, my dad was in the air force and we'd get, he'd get transferred. So I was a base brat. And so we would move to a different base and, you know, and, and then it's the old got to, the kids got to hear me talking again and, and make fun of me. And then in seventh grade, my dad retired from the air force. We moved back to our native Ottawa. I went to my very first public school. Now you got to understand. Okay. So seventh grade, um, so grades kindergarten through sixth, the big question from any of the students in your class is, what rank is your dad? Well, I go to my very first public school in seventh grade, and, and my first day there, do you have a dad? I'd never heard that question before. What does your dad do? I'd never heard that before. I mean, everybody's dad was in the military. You know, he was in the Air Force. So... You know, I found out either kid, his dad drove a Pepsi truck. Another kid, his dad was a lawyer, the whole bit. Well, here's the thing. These kids were ruthless. And they heard me talk. And they they called me Daffy Duck and everything else made fun of me. And I just went into this shell, sat in the back corner of the room. And about a month into the school year, I remember the guy's name, David Archambault, was, was uh, my seventh grade teacher. He said, and he'd call everybody Mr. or Miss. He wouldn't, he wouldn't call you by your, your name. He'd be Mr. Pataffy. He says, when the bell goes at 3.30 today, just stay in your seat. I want to talk to you. 
So I'm going, okay, you know, I wonder what I did. You know, I turned all my assignments in and everything else. Bell goes at 3.30, everybody's walks out. And this is the type of teacher he was. Instead of calling me up to his desk, which is intimidating, he comes and he sits in the desk across from me. He says, Mr. Pataffi, he said, I, I got to ask you a couple of questions. He said, number one, he said, when you turn in an assignment, anything written, he goes, you do a test. He goes, you're an A student. He says, you're a great student. But he goes, when I orally ask a question in class, and I know you know the answer, your hand never goes up. When we do current events and I tell people to bring in different parts of the newspaper, whether it's national, international, sports, entertainment, whatever, you never volunteer. We're reading this novel. He goes, and I bring kids up to the front to read aloud, and you never volunteer. He goes, why is that? I said, well, sir, it's, it's I'm shy. He goes, oh, I don't, I don't think you're shy. He said, I think it's because the kids make fun of you the way you talk. And I go, yeah, well, that, that has a lot to do with it. So he says, uh, I'll tell you what. We're going to beat this. You and I, we're going to beat it together. Takes me up to the front of the class. He shows me on the bulletin board. We're going to have a public speaking contest in our class. And he's explaining. He wants me to enter this public speaking contest. And if the class deems my speech the best, then I represent our class in the school. And, you know, later in the year. And if the school, being the teachers and the principal, deem my speech the best, then I would represent our school downtown at this Ottawa Technical High School, they had this 2,500-seat auditorium. I would represent the school. I went home in tears because I thought this guy's making fun of me. He wants me to get up in front of people and talk. The same people that, you know, make fun of me, call me Sylvester the Cat or Daffy Duck or whatever. And I told my dad about it. And my dad, uh, he did the one thing that, that I promised I would never do. Uh, to my kids, and he walked to school with me the next day because he wanted to talk to the teacher about it. And he met with the teacher before class, and they both decided it would be a good idea to do this. So I won my class, and then a month later, I won the school. And then in May of that year, I'm at Ottawa Technical High School with every other school winner from the Ottawa Board of Education and the Ottawa Catholic Board of Education, because we had two boards of education in, in Ottawa, Catholic Board from the, all the, the parochial schools and the Ottawa Board of Education from the public schools. And I'm the representative for Carleton Heights Public School. Well, I'll tell you, I'm the only seventh grader up to that time that won the citywide public speaking contest. Wow. And so Mr. Urshambault pulled me out of a shell. Um, I don't know which way my life would have went, you know, later on. Uh, but I know that um, I just, you know, I, I have this, I love to make people laugh. And, um, and it came out, it came out after that. It was pent up inside me for a lot of years. Wow. And um, so getting into the stand-up, it's one of the things uh, somebody had said to me the other day. He said, uh, well, Todd Simpson played for us in Calgary. And, uh, and he said, Pataf, he goes, you're doing stand-up. He goes, you're the perfect person for that. I said, Simmer? I said, I did it for free in the locker rooms for 42 years. <laughs> I said, I might as well go out and get paid for it now. And that's that's how I'm looking at it. Wow. What an amazing turning point in life. I think it, it's really interesting to look back in retrospect at some of those really critical moments where people appeared that helped us out, um, showed us a different way and helped us realize that, you know, we, we, we can find our voice. And I'm, I'm curious to know, is that a big part of why you work with charities today and you work especially with um, anti-bullying campaigns? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I, you know, especially anti-bullying and, and the thing is bullying when I was, you know, in seventh grade was sitting there making fun of somebody or punching somebody in the nose. And, and you know, it, and, and the re repercussions were, you know, you fought back and you, you, you know, or you went into a shell or, you know, whatever you did, but, uh, but it's, it's different these days with these devices, every kid has in their hand with the social media that, that, you know, and, 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 um, you know, the, the, you know, uh, just some of the ways kids are getting bullied and, and things like that. And some of the, 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 the things that happen, like a young girl from Nova Scotia, 14 years old, commits suicide because somebody posted a picture of her 
on social media that she shared with somebody she thought loved her, you know, and, and, um, you know, and uh, we all want do overs in life, but, you know, I read stuff like that. And I said, no, no, you know what? There, There needs to be somebody out there that can tell their story, use their platform. And so for four years, I did it in Ottawa. Uh, called No More Bullies. And then I went to Evansville, Indiana and did it for another two years there. And, uh, you know, speaking in uh, elementary schools, high school, junior high, church groups, whatever, and just talking about bullying, how to recognize it, how to deal with it. You know, where is your safe place? You know what I mean? Who do you go to? And, and um, you know, and one of the things that, that I always look at is, is my teachers growing up, my teachers had that job as a teacher not for the money. They loved what they were doing because teachers just don't get paid enough money for what they have to put up with. Agreed. So I always, I always thought that the teachers, uh, you know, especially after seventh grade and Mr. Archambault, the teachers were the go-to people. You know, my wife, who was a school nurse for, for a while before she went into uh, another branch of nursing, but she was a school nurse when we lived in Augusta, Georgia. My wife was, was, the only healthcare uh, uh, provider that a lot of these kids seen. She worked in schools in a, in a, in the tougher part of town and the lower income part of town. And a lot of these kids, her parents worked in fast food and things like that, and they didn't have health insurance. And my wife was a, was was there. You know, they would come to my wife about everything and uh, and just you know watching how she loved on these kids and the thing, things she did for them and things like that. Like there's, there's just so many areas that, that that if we're given a platform in life and i don't care if you're an athletic trainer for a junior a hockey team or or if you're the uh superstar for an nhl team you've got a platform you got to use it but you got to use it in a positive way look i get i get upset with myself because i know i get a little bit sarcastic sometimes i get caught up in things and i I, I get on social media and i'll say things and then i'll go back and delete it and i, I think my biggest uh my biggest guy that that, uh, that that helps me out with some of my social media stuff is my son Dominic. He's 21, going on 50. Um, you know, he worked uh, he worked the presidential campaign. He works in politics, and wow. and he said that you know, and he just said, Dad, he goes, I don't care what side of the floor you're on, you're gonna alienate somebody on the other side, and those are people that you know what you want to bring in and 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 share something with. And so, you know, I, I still get, you know, kind of like a guy that smokes. You know, I, I want to quit smoking, but the odd time I light up that cigarette and then I go, no, I'm going to just butt it out and things like that. So, you know, like I say, uh, there's a little bit of a platform for me. And so I, I like to use it for a positive. I love that. You're you're so great at highlighting the positives in everybody. I've heard you talk about this before too. I would love to hear a specific story about you investing in people. I know that's a huge theme in your life and it's something that I really love and want to incorporate more of in my life. Well, you know, I, th- I think first and foremost, that, uh, you know, I'm, like I'm a Christian and I believe that, uh, that, you know, every one of us was, was created by God. And, um, and that God has this plan for each and every one of us. And um, so when when I struggle with that, you know, I'm, I'm told I was given the story that, you know what, um, we, life is a, is a tapestry. And we as human beings, we have our nose against this tapestry. So all we see are these squiggly lines where God, who created the tapestry, is standing back and he sees this big, beautiful picture. So I always take it into consideration that these squiggly lines, okay, these different people, I don't care if he's got gauges in his ear or tattoos up his neck or whatever, they are part of that tapestry and they are part of God's creation. And maybe, just maybe, you know, they want to make a right turn when they should go left. Life is telling them to go left or they want to go straight and life is saying, no, you got to turn right here. So you've got to invest in those people. And the best way to invest in them is not to call them out, but is to show them how you live and show them love. You know, and, and um, I do that with my hockey players all the time is, um, you know, they, they will come in and, um, you know, they'll say something that might be inappropriate. And I'll just say, guys, would you say that in front of your mother or your sister? 
you know, and they, and they go, well, you know, Daft's locker room. And I said, yeah, but you don't want those other guys in here that that might offend them. And, you know, and, and, and that's one of the things too, you know, the world's changed. And, and, um, and so, you know, I like to invest in these guys. I remember they were all having a conversation one day and they were talking about their girlfriends in the, in the player lounge. And I said, so I looked at one of them. I said, Abram, I said, what, what's your girlfriend's love language? He goes, what? I said, well, what's her love language? I said, there's a, there's a test you can take and it, it tells about your love languages. Some people's love languages are acts of service. Some are physical touch. I said, there's this test. And so the players started calling on me on it. And they said, oh, you're full of crap, blah, 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 pataf. What are you talking about? Well, our video coach got up and he goes, no, 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 he's right, guys. He goes, my wife and I had to take that test when we were going through premarital counseling before we got married. We had to take that test. So anyway... Nothing more was said, but the guys came in the next day, every one of them that was in that lounge, and they were telling me what their girlfriend's love language was. They Googled it, and they and they um, took the test with their girlfriends, and they came in, and they were thanking me, you know, because it, it, it was going to help their relationship. And, and you know, you, you can just, you can learn, you can learn so much about people by saying nothing, but just being around them. And seeing what they say and looking at their at their body language. And, and, you know, I remember a player came off the ice, a very good hockey player, rated in the draft, came off the ice one game, and he wasn't happy when he came off. And, and I'm just standing at the end of the bench, and I go, body language. And that's all I said. I'm not a coach, but I saw his body language. And if I seen it, the 21 scouts that are in the building seen it as well. And he came to me after and he thanked me. He said, you know, he said, I just get frustrated. And I said, yeah, we all do. But I said, you know, we, we have to take that energy and use it for a positive. And I said, and body language, I said, if I notice it, like I just said to you, I said, there's 21 scouts in the building tonight, you know, NCAA and NHL. I said, they notice it because that's what they're paid for. They're paid to see everything about look for the total package. Mm. And so, you know, it, I just, just, you know, want to invest in people. And, and, um, and I think the best way, like I said, is not call people out, just show them how you live. Yeah. I love that. I, yeah, it's just so well said. I, I agree with you. I think, you know, the more we coach people about nutrition or their physical exercise or whatever, like sometimes people listen, but I, I, I can't, I can't live their lives for them. The choices they make are the yeah. choices they make. The one thing I feel like I can really do is just live the way that I think is the best way and, and try to be as positive and as, as grateful and as kind and giving as I possibly can and let that light shine because otherwise, you know, we can, we can talk about certain things, but I can't live their lives for them. So I think that's really great advice. You were, you were almost forced kind of to leave the game. You decided to come back. So not really successful in retiring the first time. What makes you think you're going to be successful this time retiring? <laughs> because I've had enough. I've, I've, I've absolutely, um, you know, I probably would have retired after this year if it wasn't a COVID year. Um, but, um, I did not want to, um, you know, three or four years down the road, look back and say, yeah, my last game was against the team that, uh, we played 20 times in May because we played a 20 game schedule against, you know, two teams or whatever. Uh, you know, so I, I, I didn't want it to end on that. So, um, so at the end of the year, um, it was funny because the coach made a joke. He goes, Hey, your contract's up. He goes, uh, he goes, you're talking about next year, blah, blah, blah. Your contract's up. You haven't signed a new contract yet. And the, uh, the assistant coaches were in his office at the time. And I said, I said, yeah, uh, I got to discuss that with you right now. So he looked at the two assistant coaches and told them, you know, to, to get up and leave. Cause he thought I was going to try and get a few extra bucks for next year. And I said, no, no, these guys can stay. And I, I said to them, I, I, I said, look, I'm fine with what I'm making. I said, but God has laid it on my heart um, that next year is going to be my last year. I said, I, I, I'm going to I'm going to not be a lame duck. I'm going to leave it better than I found it. And and I said, but next year is going to be my last year. And he came back with, well, can we revisit this in February? I said, no. I said, in February, we need to find somebody to come in that I can mentor for a couple of weeks. 
so that they can see what your expectations are so you don't go through growing pains in the 22-23 season. Mm. I said, I'll help you there in February. I'm not going to change my mind in February. I, I have, you know, the only bus I want to ride on now is a tour bus. So. <laughs> wow. Well, I mean, you said on Facebook, you're going to prepare yourself as much as you can, but when that final horn blows on that last game, it might hit you like a ton of bricks. Well, you know, it will, it will, it, it, um, you know, you, you get into, uh, you know, you've been doing the same thing for 43 years and you get into a rhythm and, and, uh, you know, I've talked to other guys that have left the game. I, I guess the greatest piece of advice I got was from a guy named Wally Tatamer, who used to be the equipment manager for the uh, Carolina Hurricanes. And he was with them when they were in Hartford and he worked junior hockey before that. And I called him up one day and I said, hey, Wally, I said, I got to ask you a question. How do you how did you know when it was your time to walk away from the game? He says, Pataf, I'll tell you how I knew. He says, when I called up a trainer who had retired and I asked him, how did you know when it was your time to leave the game? So he was telling me that I already knew it was my time to leave. That's why I'm calling, mm. you know, and, and, and I just, yeah, I've, I've had enough. Um, I, I don't know what more I, I really could accomplish in the game at my age. I'm not going back to the national league. Uh, I don't have the stamina to work in the American Hockey League. I, I, you know, I'm working in junior A hockey. It's a perfect fit for me right now. But, uh, but I, I just, yeah, I've had enough. I've seen, you know, I've worked over well over three thousand games. Wow. Um, you know, and being in the Flames organization for fifteen years, I've seen a lot of bad hockey. So, <laughs> you know, like, like it, it just, uh, I've, I've just had enough. I've, I've you know, um. I don't want to say I'm not excited about training camp this year because I'll get excited, you know, when, when the kids arrive and we're going through the medicals and everything else, but, but I'm not, not counting the days, you know, mm. a couple of years ago at the end of the year, uh, I wrote on the dry erase board in the, in the room after all, the last player had left at the end of the year, I wrote, um, September can't come quick enough. I, I didn't write that on the board this year. Mm. So Interesting. Well, what is your what is your vision for the rest of your life now that you're moving on after this season? Well, um, just want to try and keep myself healthy. Uh, I would love to see how far things could go in my other chosen profession. I love I love to get out and speak. I love to make people laugh. You know, I'm I'm doing uh, I'm doing a comedy festival in in the Okanagan of British Columbia at the end of uh, August which is one of the top com comedy festivals in North America. And uh, getting on that bill was like, well, that was huge. When I got that call, that was absolutely huge. Uh, my agency called me up and they said, look, they got, you're, you're in the Okanagan Comedy Festival. You're, you're, you know, good for you. He goes, it takes guys five, 10 years before they get in that. And they got you in. He goes, now, he goes, you got two nights, you're doing a 10 minute set and that's it. So he goes, bring your A game. And knock it out of the park. And then he goes, but on the third night, he goes, believe it or not, you're hosting the show. Wow. And he goes, yeah. And he goes, and, and they're going to, they're going to, uh, you know, they're going to do the writing for you when you're hosting. And, uh, and uh, you can do a little bit of your own stuff, but you're going to be introducing the acts. And uh, so that was like, I went, okay, yeah, well, that was big. And then um, they called back um, a few days later and said, um, Oh, the final show of your tour, which which is a mini tour, but they said it's going to be in Chilliwack on the 11th of September, a Saturday night. And I go, wow, that's my adopted hometown. That's great. So, you know, that the tickets are on sale for that. They're going well. And and um, uh, I, it's funny because I, I go, okay, you know, it's one thing to be in the Okanagan. You don't know anybody there. Um, uh, but, you know, to be in your, quote, adopted hometown – those are the same people I'm going to run into at the grocery store, uh, you know, the next week. So I better, uh, I, I better knock it out of the park there. <laughs> Man, that's great. What a cool opportunity, especially for the hosting. Like what a, what an amazing way to, you know, get more exposure and uh, meet some of the people that I'm sure you look up to in that space. That's, that's great. That's so cool. There's a, a, a guy um, that I've connected with now. Um, um, he's in Vegas now. He's a Salt Lake guy. Is that Steve, is Steve McKinley. Is that how you say it? Um, he's, you know, he's on the Golden Eagles, uh, 
page and I've connected with him and, and uh, he's made a living doing this big hockey fan and he's made a living doing this and, and he's been really good. You know, I've, I've reached out to him a couple of times and talking about things and, and uh, you know, he's, he's had a little bit of advice for me here and there. And, uh, and, uh, and that's always nice because, you know, at 65 to, to go into this, it's like, like, you know, it, it's, it's not like I'm 20, you know, and, and I found out when I did a couple of shows down in the Canadian Maritimes um, back in early July, um, you know, I, I took a red eye flight out of Vancouver um, two days before the show and got into St. John, New Brunswick on the Thursday and we're doing the show Friday night, doing a show Saturday night, and then taking a 6 a.m. flight out Sunday down here to, to North Carolina. And um, I uh, I made the mistake after the first show um, of sitting with friends that came to see me for about four hours and just reminiscing. And then the next night, I was doing a private function. And I said, well, I'm going to bed right after. But the problem was I had a 3 a.m. wake-up call because – um, the, I was playing it was outdoor and I'm playing at a winery, which is on an Island. So you've got to leave the Island, catch a ferry. They run, you know, they run 24 seven, uh, you know, and you got to, and because it was an international flight, you got to be two hours before your flight. So I was absolute toast. Then I get into Montreal and I can't take my connection because I hadn't had an updated COVID test, even though I was double vaccinated. So, you know, then they put me on another flight with an 11 hour layover in um, Newark. You know, I, I, you know, you could spend an, uh, a week in Newark in one afternoon. I mean, that airport is probably <laughs> not my favorite place to, to hang out for 11 hours, but you know, so, so I was pretty beat up, you know? And so, so um, Donna and I sat and talked about it and she goes, well, you know, she goes, you got to understand that, that, you know, you're 65 and you're going into this, this profession and whether you do, you know, like I'm doing three shows in a row in the, in the Okanagan. Well, I can't be sitting with friends for four hours after the first one because I'm cheating myself and I'm cheating the people that, that uh, buy tickets uh, by not being sharp for the second one or the third one. So I've just got to discipline myself. But you got to understand too, I've been the roadie. I've been the roadie for 42 years. Okay. I've been the guy that's got the athletes ready and they go out on the stage and perform. Now, all of a sudden I'm no longer the roadie and I'm the guy that's got to go up, but I don't have teammates out there. It's me and the microphone, you know? So, and then I don't have roadies. <laughs> so I got to be the roadie and the performer, wow. you know? So I just, I just got to learn to to take care of myself, discipline myself and, and um, and try and make something out of it. I'm looking wow. forward to it. That's awesome. It's so good for you. That's so cool that you're taking this on um, such a new challenge and so much fun. Uh, really looking forward to see how that plays out over time. When you look back on your career as a hockey trainer, what are you the most proud of? Um, I think uh, number one, uh, getting to the National League in in my chosen profession. You know, I, I knew early in my life that I wasn't good enough uh, to be a hockey player. A uh, professional hockey player. I played hockey, minor hockey, like every other kid growing up in Canada at the time. But I knew I wasn't good enough to make it. But I wanted to be involved in hockey, so I chose a path. And you know, and my first job was in Utica, New York, in the old Eastern Hockey League. The year after the movie Slapshot was uh, was filmed, and and the same type of league. You know, it was a six team league, and we were traveling. You know, places like Baltimore, Hampton, Virginia, and and uh, Johnstown, Pennsylvania, and place like that. I spent two years there, rough league to work in, then got hired in my hometown of Ottawa, two years there. So after four years, the Montreal Canadiens give me a contract to work with their American League team. Well, I thought I'd made it. You know, Montreal Canadiens, in hockey, it's the Montreal Canadiens, the Toronto Maple Leafs. Like in baseball, it's the LA Dodgers or the or the New York Yankees. You know what I mean? Like, like they were the iconic franchise. Wow. And a kid, you know, growing up in Canada during the original six, you're, you're a Montreal or Toronto fan. So the Canadians hired me. I worked two years with their franchise. Then they were moving their American League team into Quebec. I wasn't bilingual. And um, Calgary had an opening, and, and Calgary hired me. And and uh, and then I, I think a, a couple of highlights. Number one, moving to Salt Lake. And and look, I've said this. It's in my, my first book. I've said it countless times. 
And I'm not saying it because I'm on your podcast and you're from Salt Lake. Salt Lake is by far America's best kept secret. It is the most beautiful place I've ever lived. And had Calgary, uh, while I was there with Calgary, I turned down two NHL jobs. Not to leave Salt Lake. I, w- I would, no, I told Cliff because they called Cliff first and Cliff goes, hey, I got a call from so-and-so and uh, they're looking for a trainer and they want to talk to you. I said, tell them not to waste the time. I'm not leaving Salt Lake. Wow. Now, I, you know, when, when Calgary made the decision uh, six years later to move the franchise back to the Canadian Maritimes, I was one of the most vocal people about how poor of a decision that was. That when we could practice at the Delta Center in the morning and they could be practicing in Calgary in the morning, have a game that night, and they could call and say, hey, we need so-and-so, he'd be on a Delta flight at 1 o'clock and he'd be in in time and he could play the game. Mm. So they're moving us four time zones away into Atlantic time in the St. John, New Brunswick, and, and I wasn't happy. I, I was not happy. And they took a core team. We had guys like, like Randy Busick had been there for the whole six years. Rich Chernamas, Bobby Francis, myself, we were ingrained in that community. We didn't go home in the summer. We were home. Salt Lake was home. I didn't go back to Ottawa. Bobby didn't go back to to Saskatchewan. Rich didn't come back to British Columbia. We were home. Salt Lake was home. So so we we were not happy about the move, and it was a move made by Doug Riseborough and Al Coates, and they tried to be clandestine about it. And I, they were not up front with Mr. Miller. And I didn't like that. I worked for a guy uh, that was the GM of both teams, of both the Jazz and the Eagles, Tim Howells, who was one of the nicest people in the world. They weren't honest with Tim. And um, and when they pulled the plug, it, it was, you know, I, I had, I'd called them on it because I I started getting phone calls from the ownership group in St. John. And, and I told them, I said, look, I've only heard the rumors. And, and they go, well, has, has Al Coates not told you yet? And I said, no, he hasn't. And I said, in the bottom line, gentlemen, I said, I may just stay here. I was I was um, working um, part-time with um, Pioneer Valley Sports Medicine out of Pioneer Valley Hospital for a guy named Jerry Gertz. I was I was thinking of just getting out of the game and, and, and working at uh, Pioneer Valley and staying there in, in the Wasatch Valley. I, I look, look. It's just, it's a great place. The wow. greatest place I ever lived, mm. you know? Wow. You wake up in the morning, walk out in your backyard, and you look up in the mountains, and you see a pile of snow up there, and you're getting ready to go play golf, <laughs> you know? Yeah, well, I, for the listener, Brian is absolutely lying through his teeth. None of that is true. This place is awful. Don't come here. <laughs> yeah. No, we're, we're so grateful we live here. It is just, I, yeah, I'm endlessly... Um, amazed by the mountains and the valley and just that it's such a beautiful place. I'm so glad you got the opportunity to be here and again, contribute so much to the community that that just for myself personally just means so much. The game of hockey was introduced to me at such a young age and I just absolutely fell in love with with the sport and with the Eagles. And so any contribution I just, I think is amazing. And then, you know, some of these guys, if they came back here, they would never buy a drink again. People talk about the Eagles. They remember the Eagles. They remember Theo. I mean, all of those things. It's just so cool. It's an amazing legacy. Man, well, what, uh, did, go, go ahead. Going on the Facebook page, the Eagles Facebook page, it's, a, it's like going to a you know a high school reunion a weekly, and it pops up on my Facebook. There's a, there's a post on the Salt Lake Golden Eagles Facebook page, and you know you jump over and there's you know somebody with a picture of something. I'm I'm showing my family because I didn't know Don then. My kids weren't around then. Show my family these pictures of me, uh, you know, with the mullet and <laughs> uh, and. Uh, you know, back in, in Salt Lake and, and, um, you know, people, I, I do want to say this. A lot of people, uh, were not happy with Mr. Miller, uh, when he bought the team and, you know, and they think that led to the demise of the team. I will tell you this much. And, and I love Mr. Tees. Uh, he was such a good owner, but if Mr. Miller didn't buy that team when he did, we were gone, mm. we were gone. You know, the, the, they were bleeding red ink left and right. And when Mr. Miller bought it and then moved it into his arena, uh, you know, but even while he owned it for two years in the Salt Palace before uh, the Delta Center, uh, you know, was was even built. And and he changed a lot of the, you know, the bills were being paid and 
and uh, oh, you need charter flight. Well, you know what? And I want you to stay in these hotels in 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 any city that has an NBA team. These are the hotels I want. So we were moving from the you know Atlanta was in the IHL, then they had the Atlanta Knights, and we were moving from the Comfort Inn to the Marriott Marquis because Mr. Miller wanted us to be in the same hotel that the Jazz utilized. Wow. I don't know if it was a business thing or if it was just a, a you know an appearance thing. I didn't care, you know. Um, but you know, so that was in Milwaukee. You know, that was in uh, in uh, Atlanta and Phoenix. You know, and any other city that also had an NBA team, we were staying where the Jazz played. Wow. And then back then, Morris Air was a big uh, big charter company, and we we flew on them a few times. You know, and and uh, we're an IHL team acting like an NHL team. Mm. Wow. That's so cool, man. What a fun conversation this has been, Brian. I wonder if you have one simple tip you would like to leave for the listener, something from your life, your career, um, that, that people who have listened to this amazing conversation could walk away from and, and use in their life. Well, uh, if you don't mind me going biblical and it's, it's just, uh, uh, something my son and I live by and it's from, uh, Matthew five sixteen, and it says, let your light shine before men so that they may see your good deeds and honor thy father in heaven. So just be a light, man. just be a light and, and, and show people your good deeds because that, that honors our, 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 the big guy upstairs. And I don't care if you read the book of Mormon or the King James version, or if you're Jewish, um, we, we, we honor the big guy upstairs. So just, just be a light, be a light for people. I love that. And you are certainly such a wonderful example of that, sharing your message around and, you know, really providing so much positivity and optimism. So cool. Can you tell the listener where they can go to connect with you and your work? Yeah, they can go to my, my website. It's uh, three W's, brianpataffy.com. Okay. Or um, I, have, I have two Facebook pages. Uh, one is No Days Off, Brian Pataffy, or just my, my Brian Pataffy Facebook page, which is wide open public and Twitter, um, which, um, like I said, my son's going to get my, the lease showed again on me is at B Pataffy. Awesome. We will link to all of that in the show notes. Brian Pataffy, thank you again so much for the wonderful memories. <laughs> it's such, such cool, uh, stories about your life and hockey and, and just that beloved sport and the beloved team. Thank you so much for sharing your message of positivity, for facing adversity, coming out on the other side, being brave and sharing that message. It's just so cool. We're so grateful for you and all of your work and for the time you took to be on our show today. It was a real honor to talk with you. Well, thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. And this has been another episode of Boundless Body Radio. 